Welcome to Create Your Own Reality, a show about hope, inspiration, and encouragement. A program that will feature guests and topics that may inspire you to think about what is real and how you can create miracles in your life. Your host, Badi Lang. Thank you for joining us on Create Your Own Reality. I'm your host, Badish Lang, and today's guest is Tabitha Bird Weaver, a licensed marriage and family therapist and trained in Eastern and energetic healing systems. Our topic is resonance therapy and its connection to the power of manifestation. Thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Now, Badish. before we get into our topic, can you give us a little background on your name? It's fascinating. Thank you, Padish. Um, my name, Tabitha, was given to me by my parents. Initially, my dad wanted to name me Tamitha, which my mom refused. So they began with consonants. They had no idea that this had any origin in the Middle East or its meaning. It was a random pick, oh. and it's always suited me. Mm -hmm. The bird weaver. Yes, the bird weaver. My maiden name is Bird, and my married name is Weaver, and I just couldn't separate those. Um, I, I couldn't choose who I was going to be because I'm both. Something I've really been enjoying is people's reaction to my name frequently makes them think that I am of Native American heritage, which is true, but that's not the source of the name. So, Well, tell me the source uh, of, of bir a bird. Is, is that your father's name? Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. So where does that come from? That comes from German heritage, actually, with the translation from Vogel. I know. <laughs> So I think that it's a magical, wonderful trick that the universe gave me a name that suits me so well from such random places. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I want to know how you were uh, called to become a therapist and a counselor. Mm -hmm. I think, Badish, that this is something that I was born innately to do. Um, when I was growing up and the phone became a hotline for my friends, and my parents actually called it that, Tabitha's Hotline. So. Um, it's something that is a skill set and I think the thing that really led me down the path to becoming licensed and wanting to perform service specifically is having my own therapy and working out my own current and past life issues and seeing the benefit that that can have in helping me have a joyful, complete, connected life. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand that you are trained in uh, Eastern and energetic healing systems. Kind of explain a little about that. Uh, well, I have attended numerous workshops and seminars. Oh. That I know, <laughs> so many, um, related to all of those systems. I think the culminating thing that really helped me feel like I started connecting everything was when I went through the certification process with the Association of Energy Psychology, ASEPT. Mm -hmm. And uh, they really have a nice foundational course that lets people practice in their own way, but not lose sight of foundational skills and important skills. Well, it seems like it's a, a mix of the best. I think that's a good coming, way to put it. Yeah, coming together. Mm -hmm. And what about the... Um, uh, choice to go towards the energetic aspect of, of healing. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have any experiences yourself while you were going through the training? Uh, you must have had it now working with your clients. Oh. There's got to be a book there. <laughs> Several, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But in your own experience, mm -hmm. what was that like? Well, initially I received a bachelor's degree in human development, and I was already in the process of getting my master's in marriage and family therapy when I really started seeing a therapist who said to me, can I use you for a guinea pig? And I said, yes, and that was my introduction to energetic healing. Wow. But I have to say also thank you to my parents because they were always very progressive in their thinking. So we started learning about mind management and hypnosis when I was under the age of nine. So oh, it's not foreign to me. How mm -hmm. lucky you are. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Remarkably. Remarkably. Yeah. I think my first mentor was my herbalist, Catherine Corwin, um, in California. And uh, she started teaching me about energy testing and how our muscles really can indicate the congruency of our flow in our body. Absolutely. And uh, she told me I was a natural. And um, so all of those experiences compiled to me knowing that this was the direction that I'd be heading with my therapeutic practice. Well, what's the session like with you? 
What do you do? Th what's the first thing you do? That's a great question. Um, that depends on the client. Some people still are a little hesitant about energy work, so I try and ease them into it, explaining it yes. and letting them know what they can anticipate and what's not going to happen. Exactly. That's usually what they're really looking for. Um, well, they want to feel safe. Yes, absolutely. It's about safety. Yes. And uh, intimacy sometimes um, is a little scary mm -hmm. if you haven't had a lot of intimacy in your life and you have a lot of emotional uh, blockages. Yes. Yeah. So once you figure out uh, what might be one of their core issues, then tell me sort of a little mm -hmm. bit more about what, you, what it is that you're looking for and what do you do? That's a great question. I really start with where they think their highest priority is. And that is an indicator in residence therapy that is different from a lot of other systems. And that is we're always following, following the highest priority, even if it doesn't seem to make sense at the time. By the end of the session, it always makes sense. It comes together. And we find the highest priority by starting with the information a client brings and then testing. So would you like to know the, the, the process that that goes through? Well, um, I think right now, I think that uh, we could talk a little bit about that when we talk about the right. residence mm -hmm. therapy. Right now, I wanted to sort of relate to how much courage mm. it takes for a person to enter into this type of therapy in the first place. Uh, what must be going on in their life that is drawing them to find the answers. Mm -hmm. and what's going on in the world today, you must be very busy. I am very busy. Um, usually the reason people seek treatment is because something is not working and the discomfort has gotten to a place where they need input. So the symptoms that people come to see me with are family dysfunction, nobody's getting along, anxiety, depression, a lot of traumatic history, um, I do have some people that see me with bipolar disorder, trying to get some balance into their life. Mm -hmm. So basically, mood management, anxiety management, and relationships, that's really the that bottom line. That covers the whole yes. gamut, doesn't it? Yes, and I would add that pr the primary relationship is usually be between the client and themselves. You're teaching them that. Absolutely, and they're discovering it. Which is one of the most, to me, one of the most sacred things that we can do is finding that relationship with ourself and that, that uh, inner voice mm -hmm. that never lies Correct. and is a, a guidance system, really. Yes. Now, what about working with children? What have you found, in your opinion, probably over the last two or three years that seems to stand out for you mm -hmm. as to what might be a red flag that's going on in our culture? Okay, that's a really complex question, so I'll start simply. Just and I, I think, from the heart. Okay, from the heart is good. I think that the bottom line for our kids is they are not being taught how to connect to other people. Really? I know, that's, you seem shocked. Um, well, you know, um, they're connecting on... They're connecting through the, through the internet, they're connecting through a computer, they're connecting through their cell phones, but I always, I personally have always felt that there's a, a big disadvantage to the personal one-on-one -on -one that I experienced as a child. Mm -hmm. it, it causes a groundedness and then uh, people skills that you're saying these kids don't have. A lot don't. Uh, a lot of the behavioral issues that I see in my office are really related to kids' inability to have empathy for the other. Ooh, mm -hmm. that's big. It is big. And I'm not sure that that's happening completely in our culture because not everybody comes to counseling. It's usually people who are really quite distressed. I would like to tell you, from my experience yes. of what I've noticed uh, and what I feel on mm -hmm. a gut level, is it's on an epidemic level. I think uh, The accurate. absence of caring. Mm -hmm. uh, you can walk down the street and you can see that there's not a lot that's registering. Mm -hmm. This concerns me mm -hmm. because they're not taught to say good morning. They're not taught to put themselves in that position of co connectiveness. And so there's a good part of 
the children that are somewhat, I would say, emotionally immature. So this is one of the reasons so many 20-year-olds and early 30-year-olds, I think, are still living with their parents mm. because they can't adapt to society because they're not mature in areas that they never matured in. I mean, do you think I'm right? I think you're absolutely right. And there's been a lot of research about that. And really what you're talking about is the ability to delay gratification. Yes. Because when you cannot put yourself aside, even briefly, the ability to have empathy for other people, or I would say even make good decisions, really diminishes. Well, I, I think it's breeding narcissism. We're seeing it in our movies, mm -hmm. we're seeing it on television, mm -hmm. and we're seeing it in the sense of how it's operating out there in the world. Yes. And that should be a concern for everyone. Indeed. I mean, we used to be a culture that respected the elderly because they were the wisdom keepers. Mm -hmm. I see so much neglect mm -hmm. and um, um, let's just put them over here on the side and mm -hmm. I mean even in governmental concerns of what's going on right now in the politics it sort of nauseates me because mm. it's it, there's a writing on the wall and we better be waking up at least in our generation to be paying attention to what's really really going on there we need to teach children the value of, of the elderly in this country because there's a rich resource that isn't being tapped absolutely it really isn't being tapped they, it's being dismissed, I think. Dismissed. Mm -hmm. And they may know better ways. Well, I don't know about you, but I grew up with grand, a grandmother that knew herbs. Mm -hmm. She knew how to can. She had the flower gardens. I mean, she, they lived off of the land. And I learned a little bit. Um, I, was, I was that fiery kind of child, so... My sister knows a lot more than I do, but my mother learned it from her mother. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like I really missed out on something. And now at this time in my life, it's like all of a sudden, it's like I want to learn about these things because mm -hmm. I think it's going to become more necessary in, in our culture. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's backyard uh, in, in our area here in Portland. I found this out recently, and I know we're off subject a little bit, but people don't know about this. Mm -hmm. People are getting together and doing bartering in their backyards. Yes. They're coming together in, in, in little groups in certain little cities. You have to live in the city to get into the bartering group. And I think this is the, the greatest thing that could happen in this culture because they're growing things. Mm -hmm. They're making things and they're, they're bartering. And I'd love to see that come to my community. I'm totally open to that. So. I live in Hillsborough. Anybody know about this? <laughs> Let me know. I'll be there. But anyway, um, so I think there's a lot of things that these kids are dealing with that we didn't have to deal with. Absolutely. Our technology has moved so quickly, and there are so many benefits to that, but we have not figured out how to manage it. We haven't. No, and we don't know when to turn it off. It's really common when I ask people how much their TV is on to hear all day. I mean, they're not even able to break it down into hours. And it's not that they're sitting there watching it all the time, but there's an element of background noise. And I think that this is a real indicator of our, un our inability to soothe ourselves because when the stimulation stops, now we're alone with us. And what do we do with that? We don't know what to do. We right. don't know ourselves. Well, I think that's why it's so hard for some younger people to meditate. Yes because they've had the stimulation and they don't know how to get quiet um, and to go and, and do a retreat would be like oh my god a, a silent retreat I mean for some people that's a very frightening thing because yes. they've never been alone with themselves I have to find the gift of that yes uh, Badish, not to be too extreme but I have taught groups and classes where people can't last 15 seconds in silence and I think the culmination of me really recognizing our disconnection with ourselves and of course therefore our communities is when I had a woman vomit from silence. Really? Yes. It was, she was so terrified. She was so terrified and overwhelmed and overwrought. And um, for me that was just something that really kind of slapped perspective into me about how disconnected we are. 